Hey, welcome back. This is video number two in our History of the English Language course. I'm going to take you through, in a little bit more detail than I did the last video, through the different periods of the English language that we're going to look at in this class. Now, this is a funny class because in a lot of classes, you start with simpler stuff and then you get to more complicated stuff. It gets harder as it goes along. This is a weird course because it's backwards. The hardest stuff is going to be at the beginning. At the very beginning, we're going to be learning concepts and techniques and, and vocabulary from the academic field of linguistics, which um, unless you've taken linguistics courses before, is going to be new to you. And it's a different way of thinking about language than you might be used to as a literary scholar or a creative writer or somebody who's training to become an English teacher. Um, so at the very beginning, we're learning a whole new way of thinking about language. And then when we get into the material, we're going to be starting at the beginning. We're going to be starting in old Eng uh, before Old English with Indo-European. And, and then we're going to be getting an Old English, which is quite different from modern English. And it's not the English of Shakespeare, as, as you'll learn. Let's get into it. Here's the slide from the last one, just giving an overview of the different sections we're going, uh, we're going to look at. Not going to get into these right now because I'm going to just take you through them in a little bit more detail um, in the following minutes. I do want to talk to you about the abbreviations that we use in this course. This is important because you're going to encounter them all over the place in your textbooks and supplementary readings, etc. Um, OE is, middle, is Old English, ME is Middle English, and so on and so forth. One thing I want to make a note of is that um, C, if you see C before a date, and if you've ever taken any history course, you've probably encountered this, but if not, um, the C stands for circa, which is a really fancy scholarly way of saying about nearish 1150. C 1150 is a circa 1150, around, around 1150. Um, CE stands for common era. Um, and actually that should be, uh, yeah. Um, CE stands for common era. BCE stands for before the common era. These are just other ways of saying BC and AD, which stands for bef before Christ and Anno Domini, which is Latin for year of our Lord. We don't use those terms in secular scholarship. Um, because they are too associated with Christianity, which seems a little weird to me just because we're still using the Christian dating system, but it's a convention and that's what we'll follow. So the prehistory of English starts at around 3,000 years before the Common Era. That's about 5,000 years ago. Um, this is where we have uh, identified, scholars have reconstructed the emergence of a language that is referred to as Proto-Indo-European, P-I-E for short, the earliest reconstructed ancestor of English. It was spoken in West Central Asia in, in the steppes. It is also the earliest ancestor of Greek, Russian, Hindi, Urdu, Hittite, and many other languages. It's one of the most widespread and most popularly spoken uh, language families in the world. Um, other language families like the Sino-Tibetan and uh, Bantu and others are also popular, but, but Indo-European is one of the front runners, the Indo-European language family. Um, from the years around uh, 2000 BCE to 500 BCE, Indo-European speakers will migrate everywhere. They're, they will explode um, across Eurasia. They will go to India. On, on, on one part of Asia, and they will go all the way to Ireland and to, to, to the Iberian Peninsula, where Spain is in the West End. One of the reasons they spread so widely and were so, so, so successful is that they were one of the first peoples to domesticate horses. Um, and so this gave them an advantage in mobility and in military affairs as well. Uh, now, the first Indo-Europeans to get to Western Europe were speakers of Celtic uh, languages, and they continue to be Celtic speakers in northwestern France and in parts of the British I Islands. But they were then overrun by Germanic speakers, a different subfamily of Indo-European. They spread over much of northwestern Europe, um, displacing and subsuming speakers of Celtic languages. Um, a lot of uh, languages spoken in Northern Europe, um, not only English, but German, Dutch, 
Swedish, Icelandic, and so forth are also members of the Germanic subfamily. But we're going to be focusing specifically on English. The Old English period um, goes from around 500 to 1066 CE. 1066 is a really arbitrary cutoff date. But this is when West Germanic speakers migrate to Britain. It used to be characterized as a conquest. It might not be that simple. Um, during this period, uh, these um, Germanic peoples who originally worshipped gods like Thor and Odin and Freya um, were converted to Christianity, and this is where their language. This is why their their language gets written down because uh, cr the cr uh, Christianity had a very strong textual culture, and so the earliest Old English texts are written down almost entirely by Christians. Um, and it was during this time that Germanic speakers of Old English come into contact with uh, uh, Celtic speakers, um, the Britons, the ancestors of today's Welsh people, um, but also other Germanic speakers like the Danes who also uh, came over and conquered some of the lang um, English. And they were a, a kind of a cousin language and also influenced the development of English. So the Old English language closely resembles other West and North Germanic languages like Dutch, Danish and Icelandic. Um, more, uh, there is more complex inflectional morphology. Whoa, that's a lot of syllables. What does all that mean? It means that word endings indicate grammatical roles. Now we have that in English still with pronouns. I can't say him washes my car. I have to say he washes my car. This is, this is an example of an inflection. He is the subject case and him is the object case. But there were four different case roles, not just for pronouns, but for nouns in Old English. We will talk more about this in the coming weeks. In the Middle English period, um, we get a uh, expanding population, wealth, and material culture of Britain. And during this period, uh, England is conquered by French-speaking a uh, French-speaking nation called the Normans. Um, and French becomes the upper class language for a few hundred years. And there is extensive contact and influence from French, especially vocabulary. This is also a period of developing trade and urbanization. But later in this period, there will be a long war between England and France, during which we might see an incubating national consciousness of Englishness and the rising stock of the English language as, as something that can be used for literature, for scholarship, for religion, and so on and so forth. During this period, we also have a continuing um, reduction uh, and simplification of inflectional morphology. Uh, the, a lot, some of these tendencies continue during the early modern English period from 1500 to 1700. It is during this time that English becomes a national prestige language. English becomes a language of religion, science, and learning across the board in all kinds of topics from medicine to theology to law to astronomy to so on and so forth. During this period is when we get all those really, really fancy uh, 50 cent words from Latin and Greek. The vocabulary expands massively. Um, this is the period when the, the London dialect of English becomes the intercontinental standard. Um, and, and that is reinforced by printing, education, um, and, and these serve to standardize and regularize the language, and we get more and more uh, simplification of inflectional morphology. However, this is the period in which English starts to develop a more complex system of what we might call modal auxiliaries. That's compound verbs. I, I could have um, is an example of this. That would have not made of se not have made sense in Middle English. We will talk more about this when we get to the early modern unit. Let's talk about modern English. Um, again, this is not too different from early modern English, but certain words drop out, certain words are added. It's during this period that English becomes a global language and even a hegemonic language, an, an imperial language, as the British and later the US empires emerge and expand. During this period, we get some divergence too as we get um, new varieties that, that, that differ from British English, including African-American vernacular English, standard American English, 
England English has spoken in the um, Indian subcontinent, and also a new a weird new variety emerges back in Britain, sometimes called RP, and this is received pronunciation. And this is the very fancy upper class sort of Stephen Fry English, which I'm doing poorly here, but, but this was kind of an invented pronunciation in the 18th century. It was made up to be uh, a universal common form of the language, but ended up in fact just being a, an upper class educated form of the language. It's during this period that grammar assumes its modern form and vocabulary. There's an enormous increase in technical and scientific vocabulary, especially in the 19th and 20th centuries. And this is also an age of, remember from our first video, convergence. Groups of speakers who have been out of contact with each other for a long time come into contact with each other again because of railroads, airplanes, radio, newspapers. And so we get a, a beginning of a reduction of, of what you might call dialect differences. The illustration here shows um, Uncle Sam dressed in a union, union uniform reaching across the Atlantic Ocean to, to aid his cousin John Bull, who's kind of a similar type of iconic figure representing Britain the way that Uncle Sam does in political cartoons. And, and we have uh, ger like cartoons of Germany and Spain and Russia all looking on, in enraged in, in a very kind of funny political cartoon way. This, is, this, this image is from 1898, which was a period when Britain and the U.S. were making friends again after a rough start. Um, it's called rapprochement. Um, anyway, uh, present-day English sees English continuing to be a global lingua franca. That is a language that people use in common in an international and multilingual environment. This is because of media, technology, economy, and military power of what some have called the Anglosphere, the English-speaking world, which includes um, you know, Britain, the US, uh, but also Canada, New Zealand, uh, Australia, and also South Africa, and also um, uh, it should it should be said, uh, countries uh, like Nigeria and India, where there's huge numbers of English speakers. Um, English at the present day is the second most widely spoken language in the world, and there are more English learners than there are native English speakers. That's what, what I mean by L2 versus L1 here. L2 is somebody who's learning it as a second language. This is a more precise um, term than foreign language because somebody might be, um, uh, you know, an American citizen, but English is their L2, even though they're a native of the United States. Um, yeah, present day English has seen increasing uniformity in national varieties and, um, uh, less regional differences, um, a continuing reduction of auxiliary forms and inflections, and emergent debates over prestige and substandard dialects. We're going to talk a lot about language attitudes in this class and the kind of social cachet that different versions of languages have. Um, we're also going to talk about the influences of technology, mass media, and global contact on modern present-day English. Um, Next up is, the, is going to be a video on the classification and characteristics of the English language overall. In this video, I'm going to introduce you to a bit more linguistic terminology. Um, and then next week, we're going, to be, we're going to take a deeper dive into some linguistic ideas and concepts that will help us uh, for, for this subject throughout the class. Get in touch with me if you have any questions, and I'll see you next time. Bye.